Hey class, Adam Ward here. Um, I want to talk to you today about water quality modeling. Um, in particular, today we're going to do an introduction to oxygen and BOD, or biological oxygen demand. Uh, this goes along with lecture 19 in your textbook by Stephen Chopra. And so I want to start with this perspective of what is biological oxygen demand? Why do we care? Um, biological oxygen demand is representing how living creatures on this earth are interacting through the carbon and oxygen cycles and through the movement of energy through our food chains. So if we think about the world as having plants and animals and bacteria, um, plants of course are autotrophs, animals are heterotrophs, uh, and those distinctions have to do with where we get our energy. So plants are able to generate their own energy from solar radiation, um, bacteria and animals, heterotrophs consume energy from other creatures. And so we're coupled in a few ways. Um, one is that autotrophs provide the base of that um, food pyramid or food web uh, in which organic matter is generated and consumed by higher order consumers. Uh, in turn, those higher order consumers um, assimilate inorganic nutrients into their guts, into their bodies, and they basically die, decompose into nutrients that plants are using. So we've got this linkage. Um, and specifically for our lecture today, I want to think about the atmospheric component of this, uh, wherein plants are taking up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen through the process of photosynthesis, uh, and the inverse of that process is called respiration. Right? So that's what we're doing right now, breathing oxygen in and exhaling CO2. So if we think about the chemistry of that, um, the reaction process looks something like this, uh, wherein Water and carbon dioxide are the primary inputs to photosynthesis, and the primary outputs are organic matter in the form of simple sugars, um, pictured here as glucose, but that could be any organic molecule, um, and oxygen. And for respiration, you go right to left, glucose and oxygen turning into CO2 and water. And so if you remember back to lecture two in Chopra, um, we could relate these with this lowercase r coefficient and this is just simply a, a stoichiometric shortcut to relate milligrams of oxygen and milligrams of organic matter in a reaction. And so you'll recall that we can look at the molar ratios and the molar masses uh, of the two compounds of interest, and we can relate oxygen consumption to the rate at which um, organic matter, such as the glucose here, is consumed or used up to generate energy in heterotrophs. So the last slide and this slide are intended mostly to just remind you about the coupling between carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, and that organic matter and its either decomposition or its breakdown to extract the energy within those chemical bonds is how that carbon and oxygen cycle are coupled together. Now we're going to spend the next several lectures looking at in-stream oxygen uh, and this paper is one of the sort of motivating works for our exploration in this class. Um, this is a paper by Streeter and Phelps from 1925. Um, and what they're doing is looking at a wastewater treatment plant at the point where it discharges into the Ohio River in this case. Uh, and on the vertical axis, they're looking at concentrations of oxygen. <clears throat> and so if you took a sample of the water at that outlet and simply put it in a bottle, sealed that bottle shut, and watched what happened, um, you got the line that I've highlighted in red here. So through time on the x-axis, you see this exponential decay of oxygen. Well, that sounds pretty good. We've got equations to do that. Um, but in the real world, they observed something more like this, the orange line where I've labeled it Ohio River. And so there's clearly some other processes happening here besides simply the decomposition of organic matter using up oxygen. And our motivation for the next few lectures will be essentially, can we predict this? Right. Can we manage that sag in dissolved oxygen downstream of a wastewater treatment plant? Can we predict how bad it will be? Um, can we manage our outputs in a way that keeps that sag at a reasonable level? And so to do that, I want to take a look at biological oxygen demand, or BOD. Um, and we're going to start by just considering what happens inside of that closed bottle. So one thing that's important here is to get your head around what, what do we mean by BOD. Um, BOD is the readily oxidizable organic carbon in the system. 
expressed as the equivalent amount of oxygen. So why do that? Why not just say glucose or fructose or whatever other organic molecule? Um, and essentially it's because organic matter is complicated. Um, although all organic matter decomposes um, through that same sort of chemical reaction, uh, not everything is as simple to quantify as glucose. And so rather than building models for every type of organic matter, we lump it all together and say, well, we don't care what specific molecule is decomposing. What we care about is the amount of oxygen that it takes to make that decomposition happen. So that's what we mean by BOD. Uh, and Chopra uses the letter capital L to represent concentration of BOD throughout the text. And again, to remind you, we're looking in a closed bottle here. And so if we took this closed bottle of water and started with some amount of oxygen and some amount of organic matter in it, and we just watch what happens through time, we'd see organic matter go through this exponential decay, as I've shown in orange, um, and we would have had some initial concentration L0. And so we've seen this before, and we should be pretty comfortable with the idea that for something where it's just a first order reaction as the removal process, uh, we can get this exact solution of exponential decay. Now, let's try and relate that to some of the other things that are happening here. And so in purple, now I want to talk about BOD realized, meaning how much BOD has been processed or how much of the BOD is actually um, has affected what's happening in our bottle. And so as um, as organic matter goes down, the amount of organic matter that we've processed must be going up. Um, so in fact, what's been processed is really little more than one minus what we started with. Right? So that purple line is essentially one minus the concentration we've processed multiplied by that starting concentration. And so I want to think about this because it's going to help us as an intermediate step to dealing with oxygen. So we started in this bottle with some amount of oxygen. And as that organic matter decayed, uh, we might not be shocked to realize that we've consumed some oxygen. So the question here is, well, can we relate oxygen consumed to the BOD that's been processed? Um, and the answer is, in fact, yes, we can. And so the, the deviation from our original oxygen concentration, which I've labeled on that plot with an L, Right? That really is the amount of organic matter uh, that has been processed. And if we let this reaction go until everything comes into an equilibrium, what we'll find is that we've, we've consumed all of the organic matter, uh, and we may still have some oxygen left in the bottle. And so the final amount of oxygen is equal to what we started with minus the initial BOD. Right? Now, how can that work? We've got oxygens and um, BODs in the same equation. But remember, those are both expressed in terms of milligrams of oxygen per liter, or oxygen concentrations. So that's why we can put those together into that blue equation that's circled. So if we think about a mass balance for oxygen in this bottle, uh, it would look something like this. It's removed by a first order decay process. And in fact, we know that concentration of L at any given time we can express with the exponential decay equation. And so what that gives us is the ability to say, well, we, we can explicitly calculate the oxygen at any given time. It's what we started with minus that initial BOD concentration times 1 minus E to the minus KT. Now, what's the key takeaway from this slide? Because it's got tons of writing, tons of equations on it. Decomposition of organic matter and removal of oxygen trend together, and they are directly related to one another. So oxygen and BOD mass balances have to be coupled together. And I've done that explicitly with the last blue equation on the bottom of the slide there. So given something about a mass balance, uh, I want to move beyond just a CSTR or a closed bottle and actually put this into a stream. And so we can take all of the same equations that we've used in the past. Uh, in this case, this is a, this is a um, description of BOD uh, as a function of time and space in a plug flow reactor. So we've got advection and we've got a reaction term. Um, everything we used to do for initial mixing still applies. So you could do end member mixing of a river, QR, um, and a lateral input, QN. 
And if you wanted to solve that for a steady state profile downstream of a point source, the same format we used applies um, from our previous lectures. All I've done is replace concentrations with L's as to make it specific for concentrations of BOD. And so if all of our old equations work, we're really only left with one question, which is what happens to BOD in the system? Or what do we use for that KR? So if we look downstream of a wastewater treatment plant or of a different source of BOD, um, and we plot the natural log of concentration through time, uh, we'll get something like this. And you can see a few things here. Uh, one is that this looks to be some sort of first order reaction because you've got straight lines when you plot the natural log of concentration through time. Uh, the second is that there appears to be a break here and so I've illustrated that with the dashed gray line. Um, and that break occurs because of different processes dominating as we move downstream in the system. So near the wastewater treatment plant you have both settling of particulate matter and decomposition of the dissolved matter happening. And so that, that effective K is combining both settling, KS, and decomposition, KD. Uh, when we get some distance downstream, everything that has settled out, um, everything that could settle out has already settled. And so the only thing we have left is decomposition, or our settling removals become zeros. And so for BOD, um, our world is reasonably simple two types of removal, settling, decomposition, and those removals may change as a function of space. So the final point that I'd like to make in this lecture uh, is that stream geometry becomes incredibly important in these problems. Uh, and this is for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that bacteria on the stream bed are better decomposers than free-floating bacteria. So the more bed contact area you have, or the larger, um, the larger contact length with the stream bed relative to the flow, uh, you're going to get more efficient decomposition. Um, the second point is that settling velocity, as you already know, um, scales removal rates with depth. So as depth goes up, we're going to see changes in the effective um, settling rate. And I've tried to illustrate that with the blue and red lines here, uh, where in that first segment where both settling and decomposition occur, uh, we've got different slopes because there are different effective settling velocities. That's because of the, or different, excuse me, different uh, KS values, so removal rates due to settling. And that's not because settling velocity has changed, that's because the depth has changed. Uh, when we look out to the right hand side of that gray line, deep and shallow systems both have the same KD, so the same decomposition rate. So key points to keep in mind as you think about reaction rates or removal rates for BOD. Um, one is that since settling has a function of depth, uh, the depth of your system is inversely related to settling rate. Or as depth goes up, removal due to settling slows down. Uh, point B, since those bed bacteria are faster decomposers, we're going to see some scaling. Um, Chopper suggests that for depths up to about 8 feet, you do see a scaling. Um, so think from small headwater streams to uh, relatively, let's say, medium-sized rivers, we're going to see a scaling. Um, and then at some point, we have so much flow uh, that that depth no longer matters. And that point is taken to be at about 8 feet. So for shallow rivers, we are going to have to think about scaling with depth. For larger rivers, we're not. Uh, and finally, um, I want to also note that decomposition is temperature dependent, uh, and so the equation in the bottom left here may look familiar to you. That's the Arrhenius equation as applied to this decomposition rate, uh, and there's a theta value in there of 1.047. And so you'll remember from early in the class, you can simply pu plug in the decomposition rate that you may measure in the lab, so KD at 20 degrees C, and plug in your temperature. Uh, to scale that KD depending on how warm or cool your actual system is. So at this point you should be able to dis define biological oxygen demand. You should be able to describe how BOD and oxygen concentrations are related to one another. Uh, and you should be able to describe the mechanisms by which BOD is removed from a system, both settling and decomposition, 
and the factors that cause those to change, such as stream depth and temperature. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in lecture. Bye.